Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Preparing for Post-Quantum Security. My name is Leah Toms, EMEA Marketing Manager here at SecTigo, and I'll be moderating this webinar today. Joining us as speakers are Jason Sirocco, Chief Technology Officer for PKI, and Tim Callan, Chief Compliance Officer. They are going to talk us through the four NIST winners and their respective algorithms, why crypto agility matters, and what practical steps your business can take to prepare for quantum resistant encryption. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to pop them in the chat function and we'll be able to answer them at the end. Tim, Jason, over to you. Thank you, Leah. Hey, Jason, good to talk to you as always. Hey, Tim. So um, uh, this is a story that you and I have been covering in various forms for quite a while, blog posts, articles, or podcasts other webinars. Um, but in case people are joining us for the first time, we thought it would be good in the beginning just to ground everybody with a little bit of background. And then we'll get into the, the current situation and the latest of what's going on in the world of uh, uh, cryptography. So quantum, post quantum cryptography. So the first thing just to understand, this is a picture actually over to the right here. This is a picture of a quantum computer. So quantum computers look very different from what you and I think of when we, we think of as a computer or a chip. Um, but quantum computing takes advantage of quantum physics to do computing in a fundamentally different way. A traditional zero one gated computer has a bunch of binary gates and it goes down one or the other of those and when you add all those things together, that's, that's how it does its, its computing. A quantum computer, instead of having bits, have what they call quantum bits or qubits, which can be, and it's a mind blower, but quantum physics is a mind blower, can be both a one and a zero at the same time. <laughs> and, and really what they are is instead of being ones or zeros, they're percentages. They're it's 30% one and 70% zero or whatever. And um, that's a fundamentally different way of doing quantum computing and therefore, in general, the, the promises are doing computing. And the promises of quantum computers just in general be faster and more powerful. But I think in particular, Jay, it turns out that there are certain types of task that advance much more and much more quickly with a quantum computer than just any old computing task. Is that right? Yes. Very specifically, Tim, whenever you're talking about mathematical functions like factorization. In other words, whenever a computer can only do a zero and a one, a uh, computer's ability to do things such as scanning through a list of prime numbers, for example, a, a, a traditional digital computer really has no other way to go about that factorization and enumeration without just going through the whole list. And so therefore it takes a long time. But if you can short circuit that with that ability to have that third possible state of one or zero or this middle state, as you've called it, Tim, that, you know, the thing that we call the qubit. Kind of one, kind of zero, yeah. Yeah, then all of a sudden you can start to short circuit a lot of forms of mathematics that are out there. And that has huge implications for cryptography. Yeah, and so you know the these the pro there were problems that were chosen in cryptography for the specific reason that they were hard, and it happens that not all of these same problems are hard for a quantum computer, and this is where there's a concept called Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm is basically is created by or proposed by Peter Shor, um, a, a mathematician, and um, you can apply Shor's algorithm to certain specific cryptographic computing problems. And it turns out that the, that, that the time required to solve them is vastly, ridiculously reduced. And when I say vastly, ridiculously, I mean like in the ballpark of 10 to 20 orders of magnitude faster which is just kind of a, a mind blowing level of faster. And as a consequence, um, it happens that RSA and ECC, the, the basic key encryption algorithms that we use 
are suddenly are falling that camp and 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 with the widespread capability of quantum computers there's essentially no pragmatic key length we can put these in algorithms out where they will still be any good we need new math tim that's the need, that's we need new math now there's other kinds of math that as you can see by this this chart published by nist are not nearly so affected so you know sha 256 is still strong <laughs> right uh but rsa and ecc are not um and and that's sort of the consequence and and could it have been once upon a time 50 years ago when people were working on this or 40 years ago when people were working on this 50 i guess uh if they had chosen different problems then maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation now however the problems they chose at the time looked to be rock solid and they did indeed last you know nearly 50 years uh but they're not going to last another 50 or really even another five and so as a consequence um the industry has to have different cryptographic problems to use different different um cryptographic algorithms or primitives we call them that are based on different fundamental math problems and the organization that really kind of stepped into a leadership role on this as it does on a lot of similar things was NIST uh, the National Institute for uh, uh, Standards and Technology um, it's a governmental organization and um, NIST takes a lot of sort of leadership roles on tech matters where there needs to be consensus and something you know fundamentally needs to be solved for tech to consider continue to move forward um and so nist about four years ago started the search and invited primarily academics at that point cryptographers and and um uh, mathematicians to work on algorithms that could be replacements for rsa and ecc um, and there was a lot that needed to happen, right? If you think about what it is, is it's got to be an algorithm that is strong against both a traditional computer or a post or, or a quantum computer, um, but is performative as well. So it needs to generate keys quickly enough that like you can use it. It needs to have keys that are small enough that we can practically use them. It needs to have, you know, encrypted blobs, which is, you know, bits of, of, of you know, bits of data that we flow back and forth that are small enough, that are efficient enough, small enough that we can put them over, over our, our bandwidth, right? Like there's all these, these other uh, uh, criteria that have to be there or the cryptographic system still doesn't work practically in the real world. And then this last one, I think we're going to return to, it, it, it turns out to be very important is how well understood is this, right? We'd hate to have something that looks solid but it turns out it's because enough, not enough people thought about it deeply enough. And one day some genius is going to say, aha, I figured out how to break this whole thing wide open. Um, and so, so all these different criteria were in place for, for, their, for their program. Um, and then, of course, the last point was, ideally, NIST was very clear on this, they didn't want to have all our eggs in a single basket, right? One of the problems with RSA and ECC both being broken by one technology advance is we find ourselves in this pickle. And we don't want to find ourselves in this pickle again, right? So, so if there is some, if we can spread out the technology solutions to some degree between different strategies, or for want of a better word, different math problems, <laughs> then it, it, it leads us to, um, you know, a system with some, some amount of backstopping or at least a plan B. And Jay, they started out with a lot of them, right? I'm trying to remember that it was like 96 or something candidates initially. Yeah, spread across several different mathematical categories. And it, it, it turns out in the end, we still have really only come down to to almost right. a single math category outside of RSA and ECC, and 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 I'll tell you that's um, it shows Tim that it, in order to 
to be able to satisfy all these bullet points, it's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's the truth. And four years might sound like a long time, but if you take a look at how long it took to fully trust RSA, fully trust ECC, you're talking about timescales that are longer than four years. Yeah, and a very different situation, right? Like the stakes were incredibly different when RSA first started being used in the late 1970s. It was used in very, very specific circumstances in closed networks where it was highly unlikely that anybody was poking around inside your network anyway. Um, and you consider that now between the number of actors, the, 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 the for want of a better word, I'll say benefits that would be gained from, from figuring out how to defeat these things. Um, and just the, the, the level of sophistication that's gone into cyber attacks and cybersecurity in general, it's an entirely different game. And so RSA and ECC had a chance to kind of evolve in a, let's say, lower stakes and, dare I say it, much gentler environment than these new algorithms are going to have to perform in really from the first day out of the gate. So... With that, four years later, on July 5th of this year, NIST announced their post-quantum crypto winners. Um, and we'll put a star on that because we'll return to, to what that means. But they did announce these results that that NIST believes is, is solid and rigorous and, and, and ready for industry to go adopt. And these words may not mean much and that's okay, but you know, for public key encryption, it's Crystal's Kyber, which I think in general just refer to as Kyber and most people just refer to as Kyber. And then on digital signatures, it looks like Crystal's Dilithium, which again, most people just refer to as Dilithium, will turn out to be the, 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 the widely used uh, signature algorithm with Falcon and Sphinx, these other two, as um, sort of alternatives for specific use cases. Right, Jason? That's correct, Tim. And in fact, for those of you who are curious, uh, Kyber and Dilithium are both lat come from the lattice-based uh, cryptography camp. And uh, so, so it, what's interesting about lattice, of course, Tim, is the fact that it's one of the longest studied math problems going and so some of the al other alternatives are having some some growing pains that lattice just isn't at the moment yeah. hence the the reasoning that kyber and dilithium kind of bubbled up to the top because those bullet points you had shown previously kyber and dilithium did a great job of being you know very well known in terms of how they're solving the problem and also being very practical in just about every single cryptographic use case. And that's an important point that NIST made about those two particular crypto systems in the sense that they're, they're going to be standardized. That's the plan. Uh, so there's going to be a standardization process, but as well, the intent for both of those is that they're going to be very generic and wide ranging in their use. As you mentioned, Falcon and Sphinx are, are going to be something that you, you'd have to know why you'd want to use it. They're going to be very specific. But uh, Kyber and Dilithium really did bubble up to the top. And, uh, you know, so thank goodness, uh, you know, we do have very strong candidates, Tim, for, yeah. for the post-quantum world. That, I think, is one of the big outcomes that, that we really should make. And and not only that, but they're they're going to be useful for a very wide and generic set of use cases. Which is good because that's basically, that's that's the the world, the crypto world that computing, you know, that connected networked computing has evolved around, right? So RSA originally was ubiquitous and it was all RSA all the time. And as we started to get our lands, right, our networks that we controlled, we did encryption using RSA. And then when that moved into uncontrolled networks, what ultimately we wound up calling the internet, that too used initially RSA and then later on RSA plus ECC. 
And so that was always this assumption that there was this one strategy that was just going to use. So you just plug into whatever you're plugging into and it just all just works. And that is a very valuable outcome in terms of how we, we do our networking today. So yes. Now, however, so that was what they called round three. They had three rounds to get to these points. And, and these, these four algorithms are called, quote unquote, the round three winners. And these are ready for standardization and use. But NIST isn't done. They have what is called round four, which they're continuing with. And this goes back to the earlier point, which is that, as Jason mentioned, Kyber and Dilithium are both lattice-based. And lattice-based uh, uh, cryptography is really the only game that NIST is giving us right now, essentially. Um, and the, the question is, okay, well, what if some genius with a whiteboard tomorrow thinks about this problem in a way that nobody's ever thought about it before? And it turns out that we can, that lattice-based mm -hmm. cryptography is essentially defeatable. Well, under those circumstances, what do we do? And so the, um, the, the NIST round four is really to get some of our eggs in other baskets, right? To give us a fallback so that in the event that it turns out that this lattice-based strategy is not all that we think it is, what are we going to do in its place? Um, and um, there are four, right? And by the way, this isn't this isn't so absurd, right? If you look down at the bottom, so um, these less tested strategies, somewhere along the line, this is exactly what can happen to them. So Rainbow, which was around three finalists, was defeated very abruptly and completely in March of 2022, just like completely unusable as a crypto algorithm once people figured out and published the, the strategy for beating it. And then Psych, which was one of the round four candidates, likewise was just completely smashed in August of 2022. The same reason somebody figured out, right, people puzzled together the correct strategy, and I can't explain the math underlying it, but how people puzzle together the fundamentals of how to do this and completely smash that as well. And so, you know, that's that's part of the reason. And I think you said, Jay, one of the good things about Lattice is it's, I want to say, more examined than some of these other strategies. Yes? Yeah, Tim, it's a, it's a form of number theory that's been around uh, a very long time. And this form of geometric mathematics uh, has been studied uh, in many different ways and many other forms of the mathematical field. And for cryptography, it's, it's one of the oldest in terms of being a candidate for, uh, for study. And so therefore, yeah. mathematics in general and cryptography maybe more specifically it's it's one of the the grandfathers of the uh, of the mathematical scheme is being studied and so psych right the this it's actually an acronym stands for super singular isogeny key encryption well super singular isogeny uh in terms of a scheme is actually quite related tim to elliptic curve right mm. so you might think well, then there must be, you know, there must be a lot of trust and study. Good, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And there is a lot of good to it. The problem we're having and the problem that Psych just had was in how to best implement it without giving away secrets so that it can be uh, defeated easily like it was in August 2022. And so, so therefore, it's not so much the underlying math as much as the the implementation defeat, Tim. Which is which is an it's it's a, that's a whole other level of maturity that some of these candidates need to be able to achieve, and and simply yeah. have not at this point. 
Yeah, and um, if that's an interesting topic, by the way, Jason and I did a whole podcast episode just on at psych being defeated. And so, you know, after this webinar, if that's something you'd like to learn more about, you can look it up and I'll, I'll show you where to find that at the end of this presentation today. Um, but uh, yeah, so these round four KM candidates are still going to continue. And, you know, it is possible uh, that one or more of these will also be released in the future by NIST as potential additional uh, encryption algorithms that we can then build into our systems and be ready to roll over to in the event that we decide somewhere down the road for one reason or another that we can't use these lattice-based strategies anymore. Um, and in fact, one of these, I believe, classic McAleese, uh, second one on this list, the reason it's included in particular is because it's been around a long time and it's been I'd say well tested, well studied. And so there's a greater degree of confidence that it would hold up to the scrutiny of, of being a major standardized encryption algorithm, right? That's right, Tim. I guess the, the reason why it, it wasn't chosen for standardization already is because of question marks around those early bullet points you had yeah. around usability because it has yeah a very large private keys and some latency issues. Uh, however, uh, however, modern modern computation has solved a lot of that. And so therefore, again, it comes around to what I just said, which is the math is good, but the implementation needs to be proven. And that's right. what hopefully will come out in round four. And heck, man, it's better than just not being able to encrypt anything, right? So if you really thought about a worst case scenario, would we rather have like slower performance <laughs> and less less convenience when it comes to things like creating certificates or would we rather just plain not have them and under those circumstances i think the answer is is very obvious and so um you know that's that's a good example of this just making sure that feeling good about the, having some kind of worst case fallback so so okay so these things are released this Put out an announcement on July 5th, everything changed, right? Did everything change, Jason? Is everything completely different now? Uh, <laughs> no. no, it's not. It's not. In so, fact, what, what was what was really announced, Tim, was the 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 basically the, the choice of of basically moving forward towards standardization, which again is going to take yeah. some time. Yeah, so that's the next step. So we're now moving into the next step, which is not going to be visible to most of us, even those of us who are IT professionals, which is that now it needs to get standardized. So there are various industry standards bodies who talk about how computing stuff interacts with other computing stuff. And we need these things because without these, you know, I could sit and I could create a, a chip or, a, or an operating system or a, a machine and not be able to rely on the fact that it's going to talk successfully to other operating systems and chips and pieces of software and machines. And so the standards bodies provide that for us. They, 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 give, they give people a rule book that everybody can go to. And as long as they all implement the same processes and ways according to the same rule book, it all works. And so these are things like IETF. There's lots of them. And these standards bodies now have to do their work, which is to say, you know, in some cases, a digital signature algorithm will have to be chosen. We figure it's mostly going to be dilithium, but not always. So there might be some circumstances where people are debating that. Um, and then standards will need to be adjusted. So these new algorithms will work with them and those updates need to, and they go through their own process and people need to read them. And oftentimes these are public and they're available for public commentary. And oftentimes they have certain timeframes that they must follow according to their process and all that stuff's got to work. And then at the end of that, these guys are going to start rolling out updated versions of their standards that say specifically what you must do to support these new algorithms. And this is just Jason and me looking at our crystal balls, but we say this could take a year or more. Um, and I'm going to tell you that some will, they won't, won't all be done at the same time, right? Some will come earlier and some will come later. And there are some that are going to be positive laggards. Where we're all tapping our feet saying, hey, when are you going to get this done? So that needs to happen 
And a lot of the progress really will depend on that, right? That there are going to be a lot of people who can't take action and can't do their thing until those decisions are fundamentally arrived at. So that's really the arena that this has moved into now. Now the next one, so then what'll happen? What'll happen is as, as these standards bodies occur and to the degree that they're needed, then hardware, software, and services vendors are going to need to, need to provide support, right? So, so, you know, we at Sectigo, we're a public CA. We are going to need to be able to offer certificates once it's gotten to the point where we're able to, where we're allowed to, according to the rules that we must follow, which right now we're not, then we will be able to offer certificates for the public to use that will take advantage of, of these new encryption algorithms. Um, so, you know, many of these are going to have to wait for the standards first. Now, when the standards come, they're going to be developing. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't get started now. And I think most of them probably are. They're researching, they're looking at these algorithms and things like key sizes and performance. And what does this mean for my systems? And what do I need to do to make this work? And where do I need to change my code to plug that in? Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully vendors are looking into this. If they're not looking into this, they need to get the memo and they need to start. And then, you know, again, I would hope the vendors, the good vendors are going to be out to the public telling them that they are going to support these things and they plan to support these things. And as they get their questions answered and they work about work out things like timing, that they will be able to actually go and say, this is when we're expecting to have support for you. Uh, uh, because, you know, their, their customers need to know that and understand that. And the vendors and their partners and their ecosystems and all that fundamentally need to know and understand that. Again, Jason and me making this up, but this could take another year or more, very reasonably. Once they get the information that they need from the standards bodies, and once again, there will be early adopters and there will be laggards. And there will be people who are all looking at them kind of saying, come on, haven't you got this done yet, really? Um, and, and all of that will occur. Right, Jay? For those of you who want to be early adopters, you can be. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, public CA, such as a Sectigo, uh, you are able to engage with us and be able to set up from a private trust standpoint, a certificate authority uh, to, and an intermediate CA to be able to issue a special kind of certificate that is known as a hybrid certificate. And that will allow you to bridge between ECC and RSA systems that are traditional. And ultimately the secret that you're encrypting or signing would be able to be contained within the hybrid certificate with a post quantum algorithm. And yeah. so that is Tim, something that if, you know, I'm, I'm recommending to everybody who, especially who's on this webinar right now, to really think about getting your hands dirty in terms of just seeing what the technology is going to look like because because the early forms of it are available and even though the standardization of some of these algorithms are not complete you are able to issue certificates with early forms of these algorithms and so in terms of what happens now part of what could happen right now is you could be an early adopter, get your hands dirty, get used to working with this kind of key material. Yeah, and I know you said this, but let me just reiterate it. Uh, this would be available for your private CA usage, right? We can't give you a public cert that does Correct. this, but for your own, for your own CA, for your own, you know, where you're the CA and you're and you're you're signing, there's every reason why you could do this because you get to do whatever you want. Um, and again, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect, uh, support the, the systems that you're going to use in production. Um, I wouldn't assume that everything that you're buying off the shelf is, is going to work correctly with the hybrid certificate. So I don't know if I would be throwing them into production systems, but there's no reason why you can't be putting something in a dev environment or your own sandbox and seeing what they're all about. Um, you know, someplace where if it goes down, nobody cares. 
and that would be um, that would be yeah that would be a good con uh, consideration. We'll actually return to that point um, in a, in a slide or two. So thank you for that, Jason. Um, so then we think most of the work will be done for you by the people who provide you technology. And what you're going to need to do is you're going to update your technology, right? So mostly you're going to be running software. You're going to be like, let's use the example of your, your, your OS, right? Your desktop OS or your server OS or your, or your, or your mobile OS, right? Those vendors who provide that, no matter who that is, you know, Microsoft, Apple, Android, et cetera. Apache, those people have to do the work to import uh, support these algorithms. And what you have to do is you have to make sure you're using the current version of the OS. So that is a lot of how this will happen is it will be at the uh, operating system level or the software level or the SaaS level. And those people will do the coding and the development and the work. Some, some software and hardware will be completely unaffected, right? I, it, it might be that my webcam doesn't care in any way, right? And it's completely irrelevant, and that could be the case. Um, and um, But you also probably will have to, so some of this will be happening through auto-update for you. SAS should just happen. That's the good thing about SAS. Um, but some of these things you're probably going to have to up, do updates and patches, um, and there may be hardware that has to get swapped out, right? If you imagine a bunch of um, bespoke IoT devices that are not updatable, uh, those might just plain not support post-quantum crypto. And you, your, your choices might be limited to not using them replacing them with new ones or using them in a fundamentally vulnerable fashion, right? And, and I know that could be a rotten choice, but that may be the choice. Um, we also think that legacy systems could, there could be legacy systems. We know there are lots of legacy systems in use in enterprises, right? We know this all the time as we talk to, you know, CIOs and, 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 and the people who roll up to them that are old, and difficult to update. And so enterprises might be scratching their heads trying to figure out how to deal with these things as well, right? Where I'm using RSA in an environment where it's not trivially easy to swap out the, the cryptographic primitives. Um, but at the same time, I don't really want to be exposed. And, you know, those are the, that's the kind of hard work that the enterprises are going to need to to take on and handle as these, you know, in, in the, in the couple years to come as their uh, other support rolls out to the level where it's implementable by them. Um, so Tim, mm -hmm. part of what you've seen from CISA, the department of Homeland security and, and others, uh, they've been talking about this and they've, they've got their own, you know, what enterprises need to happen now and top of their list is taking inventory. Yeah, and, and really the spirit of this list that you're seeing here in this slide is while you're taking inventory, you know, th these are some of the attributes that you should be assigning to each of your inventory items. But yeah. that that is the first goal of probably any security task is understanding what your vulnerabilities are, understanding you know, where are the systems, the legacy and otherwise that that you have out there pki and certificates and the places in which these cryptographic algorithms are utilized in your enterprise are ubiquitous this is something tim and i have pointed out mm -hmm. countless number of times in various communications we've had and so therefore inventory is very very important and the spirit of this slide is all right once you have your inventory line item how do you think about it yeah and and you know if you and if any of your line items include difficult uh constrained devices such as iot those those might be ones that you want to circle right and that, right. that's the spirit of this and also getting a sense for as i said these vendors are going to do things for you we are expecting and nobody uh, that i've seen is doing this yet but we're expecting that as vendors wrap their heads around what they're going to need to do that they themselves are going to be publishing 
uh, for want of a better word, let's say roadmaps, right? They're going to explain, we're going to offer this support. We're going to do it this way. Here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to do it in this time frame. And that sort of stuff is also a valuable part of your inventory to track over time. You can't take that inventory today because these vendors themselves are trying to wrap their heads around the problem. And they don't even, they can't even know that until they know when their standards are going to come out. But they will be communicating that kind of thing over, let's say, the next 18 months. And as they do that, you want to keep an eye on those things. You want to track them and you want to have in your own plans and understanding, I am expecting this particular piece of the puzzle to get solved in this time frame, right? And then you, you know, you can have yourself, you can have a little bit of a white space exercise, which is to say, okay, these are the blanks. <laughs> these are the people who have no answer for me. And those are the things that worry me right? Or these are the people who have said something, but that date has come and they haven't delivered it yet. And so now I'm getting worried about that, right? Those, are those, and, and that's part of it. It's just understanding what's your full, what's the full scope of your, of your organization and what are you prepared to, to do there? And I think that's actually, you know, Jason, you led us right into number four, which is enterprises can be making their action plans. And this, you can really even start on now, Right. But what is this going to have to look like? You're going to have to understand what all of your systems are. Everything that involves or needs crypto, you're going to need to know what it is. You're going to need to know where it's coming from, which of these categories it falls under. If a vendor is going to be solving that for you, you need to know that the vendor intends to solve that for you or states they intend to solve that for you and how and when they propose they're going to do that. You need to know what needs to be required on your side. Am I going to have to patch this? Is this going to occur automatically? Uh, is this require hardware to be swapped out? In what kind of time frame? Um, and then you need to know that you're going to have a process, right? And so ideally, every single component of your digital world will be accounted for, and you'll know this is how this problem is going to be solved. This is when it's going to happen, and this is what we're going to do to solve it. And did it occur? Are we on track? Uh, uh, and then in particular, one, one piece that flows through all of this is certificates. So the certificates you're using today invariably are not supporting post-quantum crypto algorithms, right? They're just not. So you're going to need to take an inventory of all your certificates. And this is one of the things we run into a lot is Certificates that the CIO doesn't know about. We call them rogue certificates or even rogue CAs, right? Entire CAs that are stood up and the CIO, and the CIO has, has nobody ever told them, right? And so under those circumstances, it's important for you to understand what certificates are out there and that those get built into your inventory and your action plan as well. So we have these certificates of these types and these circumstances. Here's how they're provisioned. Here's where they're physically hosted. Here's the duration we use. Here are the other parameters around them. Here's what we need to do about them. Um, and then, um, you know, part of that is all of those certificates are going to have to get cycled out and swapped out. So if they're short-lived certificates, it's not a big deal. If you're replacing them every 30 days anyway, that will happen in the actual course. But if you're out there on your private CA and you're dumping five-year certificates on stuff, then you don't want those to sit around for five years. So those are going to have to all get changed out and you need to have a plan for that. So you need to have some kind of automation or management plan or a rock solid process to ensure that all of that is done as well. And you know, that's done. And then again, per the previous slide, make sure you think about how you have to report this, right? You may have compliance needs around you doing this. You may have to report this to your board of directors or to, you know, your, your external stakeholders. You might have customers that require this or regulatory or regulatory bodies that require this. So you may need to be able to produ produce evidence that you have accounted for this as well. And these are all of the pieces that need to be built into that action plan. And yes, does that sound like a complicated action plan? You betcha. Does that sound like something that has a lot of thinking needs to be done and a lot of knowledge needs to be gathered? Absolutely. And all the more reason to be working on how you're gonna do this and starting this really now. Tim, I'm going to give you a real world example because I, I think it's important. I, I think a lot of folks who might be listening to this are, are thinking of the obvious 
SSL use cases for their web servers, right? SSL mm -hmm. certificates, your OVDV, uh, you know, EV certificates that you're used to working with. I'd like to give you another example. Uh, TLS certificates that are used for DevOps. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are running any kind of uh, Docker containers with an orchestration engine such as Kubernetes. Just, I just throw that out as an example because it's just so popular. Uh, believe it or not, you are using these certificates. Yeah. And therefore, you should be taking inventory of how is your CA set up underneath yeah. that that is issuing those certificates what's the cryptographic algorithm being used and how you're going to handle uh that the plan going forward when basically you know the, these these not only do these certificates need to be swapped out typically they're very short-lived but also the underlying certificate authority may need to change its configuration take that into account put that into your yeah. you know your 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 inventory and your risk list because that's you know, that's just one more example out of many that you're going to find that you that might not be top of mind. And by the way, that's one of the ones that occurs all the time that you, we see routinely is that there's, you know, in, in organizations where there's somebody who feels that they're responsible for the certificates, which often is the case, uh, we, we, we frequently see that DevOps kind of environments that must have certificates or they don't work uh, are implemented by teams that don't roll up to those people and that the, the quote unquote certificate group doesn't have any visibility on that CA, doesn't even necessarily know that it exists. If it does exist, doesn't have any visibility on or control over what kind of PKI decisions were made there. And so now you can easily see that one slipping through the cracks where, oh, we got all our certs, everything's post-quantum, we're great. No, we're not. It turns out our DevOps environments are using the same old stuff that somebody slammed in there in 2019 and never thought about ever again. And um, uh, all that stuff is just wide open. So that's the kind of thing you can't let slip through the cracks. And that's the kind of thing you absolutely need to be looking for. So to make it easier for you, you mentioned um, hybrid certificates. We actually have a hybrid certificate toolkit you can download, load, and use, um, and that's available on our Quantum Labs site. So if you go to secdukecom slash Quantum Labs, there's a bunch of information. There's the hybrid cert, there's the, the hybrid cert toolkit, and there's just a lot of information. We cover this topic in real time as it develops and you know, populate all that information to that place. So you can come here and, and you can make sure that you're current with developments. That's something we recommend. Uh, uh, these are still moving targets. You know, we just showed you if we had given this, if we had given this uh, uh, seminar or this webinar a month earlier, we would not have been telling you that Psych had been defeated because <laughs> at the time it hadn't been, right? So all of this stuff is developing in real time and um, we're keeping you current there on that page. So it's a good place to go and look. It's also a good place to get your your hybrid cert toolkit and start monkeying around with it and seeing what it can do for you. Uh, so we recommend that, sectigo.com slash quantum labs. And um, I, I said I promised I was going to do this. Um, Jason and I have a podcast where we talk about all things cryptography and digital certificates. We've been doing this for more than three years. We have hundreds of episodes on there. There's lots and lots of information to go gather. And part of that is that we are covering uh, the progress in the quantum cryptography space in real time as it occurs. So this is also something that I recommend that you subscribe to. You can stay current on what's going on in PKI. You can learn about esoteric little corner cases of the, of the industry that you never understood about. And maybe, maybe something, some of that's interesting or, or useful. And uh, you can keep current on developments with quantum crypto. And so just go get us, you know, Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, et cetera. Wherever you go listen to things, feel free to go to listen to, to us there. And with that, we said 45 minutes. It's actually 43 minutes. So I think we are ready for questions and answers. Leah, do you have any questions? Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Jason, for the insights. Um, we've got a couple of questions through. First one was, how does a hybrid certificate work? Right. So, so at a high level, I think, Jason, you kind of touched that, right? It's got, it's actually got both of them. It allows support for more than one algorithm. So you would put in your, let's say your RSA, and then you would also put in your, your Kyber, right? 
and they both sit in there. And then the basic idea is that if, if the systems that are talking, right, if the clients, so that the server would support Kyber and RSA, if the client that connects to the server can talk Kyber, great, let's do that. But in the event that the client can't, if the client does not have Kyber support and the climber must support RSA, then we're still able to have a connection. And so what it does is it gives you a migration path because imagine what you're gonna do otherwise. If we're switching out to new crypto, then all of a sudden everything has to change on the same day, the same instant. And if everything doesn't change on the same instant, then some of them stop working. Well, that's pragmatically at best, extraordinarily difficult, maybe impossible. And so what you can do instead is you say, well, look, I'm going to put up a hybrid cert and then I'm going to start the client systems are going to swap out over time, either because I'm swapping them out or because they're out in the market, they're out in the world, right? They're people I don't control, they're partners and customers and stuff like that. And I need to be able to make sure that I can connect to you using the best, both post-quantum, if you've moved to it, but I need to have some period of time where I'm still allowing those old algorithms to work as well. And then imagining, you know, depending on the use case, but probably somewhere along the line, you, you, you draw a line, you cut it off, and then you force everybody to post quantum. And at that point, you take away your, your hybrid cert and you just offer a PQC. Does that sound right, Jason? Yeah, Tim, it's a, it's a bridge between uh, what, what will become legacy systems and new systems. And what's really great is that it, it, the whole idea is taking advantage of the fact that you have fields within the X509 standard for certificates mm -hmm. and the definition of which cryptographic algorithms you're using are defined within those X509 fields. And that gives you immense flexibility. And so it's a really brilliant idea that ultimately at the end of the day, a lot of legacy systems that may never be able to talk to anything other than RSA and ECC crypto systems will be able to interact with those certificates without having to know anything else about the complexity of post-quantum post cryptography. And so it'll be a phenomenal bridge that I think will be with us for a really long time, Tim. Yeah. I mean, the other way you might want to think about it is... Um, Let's say that I had um, a building and a bunch of people had keys and I wanted to rekey the locks, but those people were out there in the world with their keys. Well, one thing I could do is I gather everyone together and I take their old keys and I give the new keys and I have the locksmith rekey the locks. And that might not be practical. So under those circumstances, plan B would go as follows. I take a door, I have the locksmith rekey the lock with the new key. And then every time you come visit me, if you have the old key, you have to go around to door number B. And when you come into door number B, I take away your key and I give you your new key. <laughs> and then from now on, you use door number A. And when everybody who has a key has visited the building at least once, now I've moved everybody over to door number A. And then I can rekey door number B. And now we're all on the new key. And that's kind of the same strategy, right? You give them some amount of time, like you said, a bridge where you can come in with either one. And then you get people swapped over to the new better lock over time. And somewhere along the line, you can cut off the old lock. So that, that I, I, we're predicting that that will be a frequent strategy in the real world. So it's something that you want to wrap your head around, see how they work, understand what you would do, and start thinking about how you would actually be using it. Perfect. Um, another question that's come in was, can you speculate on the impact to cryptocurrency um, with new quantum resistant algorithms? Tim, if you don't mind, I can, I can probably talk Go. to that. Sure. Uh, if you take a look at Tim, Tim, one of Tim's earlier slides about uh, hashing algorithms, right? So you might have seen a few different primitives in there that were not necessarily... Uh, right, like SHA-256 as We're an example. We're not greatly affected, yes. Not greatly affected. So if you think about blockchain in general, if you think about uh, what makes blockchain blockchain, it, it is essentially um, hashing algorithms that are at the heart 
of how the blocks on a blockchain are put together on the ledger. And thankfully, the cryptographic algorithms that are used to do that are typically hashing algorithms that are not as uh, susceptible to quantum computing and various algorithms such as, say, Grover's algorithm against it. And I think this chart did a good job at helping to explain that. And we, we may in the future even point out, you know, some of some of the very specific crypto systems that are used within blockchain. But I, I think using SHA-256 just as an example should give you an idea that those types of primitives are not as susceptible. And that's uh, that's a good thing for all you folks in blockchain. Yeah. Now, it's worth understanding that uh, blockchain is, is a technology. A cryptocurrency is an entire system or entire ecosystem. And cryptocurrency ecosystems also depend on PKI right? It's nothing else. It's things like logging into your brokerage account, right? And the machines that, you know, do these kind of transactions in the background talking to each other. So all that stuff is still going to have to get updated, right? Everything PKI based will have to get updated. So cryptocurrency vendors themselves or vendors in that ecosystem in that space or NFT vendors or other people, you know, who depend on blockchain are invariably using PKI in any number of ways and digital certificates in any number of ways to make their services available. And that too will need to be updated or there will be vulnerabilities. So just because the blockchain strategy itself is relatively unaffected does not mean that your favorite cryptocurrency trading firm or your favorite cryptocurrency is not entirely unaffected. If that makes I think, sense. Tim, I think the question to ask of your exchange and the question to ask of the cryptocurrency that you are using specifically, I think the most important question is what cryptographic algorithm was used at the creation of the key pair, which essentially the public key of the initially created key pair of your account becomes your, your crypto wallet. Mm hmm and it, basically RSA and ECC are not terribly potter in terms of that particular PKI, but uh, you know the answer to the question really comes down to what algorithm is it and is that algorithm that was chosen susceptible to uh, quantum computing and Shor's algorithm? That's the question you really would have to ask depending on the cryptocurrency. All right, cool. Next one there. Great. Um, another question was, what are going to be the early targets for quantum computers to crack? Oh, probably high value. Like, like, so here's the thing to think about. There's, there's strategy that people are pretty sure is going on right now, which people call harvest and decrypt. And the basic idea goes that if I'm a bad actor, I probably don't have the ability to break RSA today. I don't have a quantum computer that will do that for me. But what I do have the ability to do is to grab blobs, binarily large objects, I don't know what they are, and put them on storage, put them on platters, right? Just store them. And then someday in the future, I will have the ability to decrypt them and I'll go back and I'll see what's in them. So if you're transmitting information that's not going to be valuable in a year or three or five, it's probably less important. My credit card will be expired by then. So if my credit card number is sitting in a blob, I don't really care all that much. But there's plenty of information that will stay valuable for a long time, industrial secrets, um, uh, state secrets, uh, 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 things that will have value. You know, think about how long the oldest cryptocurrencies have been around. You were talking about your, your, you know, your cryptocurrency ID as an example. And you know, if that thing will still have value in five years or you know, in 10 years, that becomes a real juicy target starting today. Um, you know, and uh, it'll probably be, you know, the things that will be more valuable over the things that will be less valuable. But it's possible anything that would still be a secret you don't want revealed in, let's say, five years, certainly in 10 years, is a secret that you should worry about. 
Great, great. Um, another question was, what happens if the other post-quantum cryptography candidates all get broken as well? Yeah, what if everything got broken? <laughs> <laughs> it would be bad. Um, uh, you know, that seems unlikely. Uh, but I think that's why NIST is doing what it's doing, is to make sure that, you know, in the event that somebody did, you know, have a genius moment and smash lattice-based cryptography, that there would be something else we could all do, right? And as we mentioned, you know, worst case scenario, if we all had to use classic MacAleese, it, it might be a bummer in certain ways, but the world wouldn't stop, right? And if there were no cryptography at all, the world would basically stop. Um, and, and, and that would really, really, really suck. Do you want to add to that, Jason? Sure, Tim. I, I think if, just a couple couple things about that. Um, the, the, the difference in mathematics between the different schemes is very wide. And that's a good thing. Uh, it, it makes the chances of what we're talking about here much less. But as well, keep in mind that even in just Lattice alone, there are several ways to create tough problems for quantum computing. Not just one way. Mm. There are actually many ways. And on top of that, there are many ways to implement. And so therefore, the richness, I, I cannot overstate the richness in the math that's being brought to bear to create post-quantum algorithms. Yeah, and we, the we, okay. No, go ahead, Tim. We also have an episode that deep dives just into lattice-based cryptography in general. So if this is an interesting topic, you might want to go find that one on, on our podcast also. And we, we spend, you know, 20 minutes just on that topic alone. So that's yeah. a good one to go listen to if you're interested in that. Yeah. Perfect. Um, another question that's come up, why aren't we addressing an option such as AES and one-way hashes? Yeah, I, I, think we, I think we covered that quickly earlier, Tim, which is the fact that uh, Gro Grover's algorithm uh, basically uh, as a scheme against quantum computers is really not as strong as, say, Shor's algorithm. And so therefore, those, yeah. those types of primitives... Can you go watch the cartoon with you? Those types of primitives that are not necessarily, um, you know, related to ECC, RSA, those that are very specifically related to things such as hashing algorithms, um, they're, they are not as vulnerable or not vulnerable to Shor's algorithm and not nearly as vulnerable to uh, to, to post-quantum uh, environment. And I think that one of the earlier slides that I now, I think we've shown a couple times, uh, helps to point that out. Perfect. Um, and then we have one final question. Um, why was site broken so easily? Is that a reflection of the rest of the candidates? I, I, Psych is an interesting topic uh, that's a super singular isogeny key encryption, right? Which was broken just last month, August of 2022. And I think one, the best way to really think about that is it was not necessarily the mathematics that was defeated as much as it was the implementation of the cryptography. In other words, uh, one of the downsides to psych and super singular isogeny as a, as a scheme in general is the fact that as you are decrypting as a legitimate user, there is certain amount of information about the, the private key that needs to be given in order to be able to, to unfold the geometry of the, the mathematical problem. And there was a proposal all the way back in the late 1990s for how to break schemes such as Psyche, which was tested. And that was the paper that was published in August of 2022. So what you're seeing is actually quite healthy in that the underlying mathematics is still quite sound but the implementation of super singular isogeny still needs to be worked on to make sure that not too much information is being given up as part of the decryption path that needs to be taken. 
And so, you know, I don't want to get too much into the weeds. And as Tim said, we do have a podcast on that that goes into it quite in depth. But, uh, you know, like I say, it's it's one of these things where the you got to go back to the the scientists have to go back to the drawing board, not necessarily with the math, but on the implementation piece. Sounds great. Right. I think we're literally at the hour now. Thank you, everyone, for your time. If you've got any more questions, do get in touch with the, with the Sectigo team. And also keep an eye on our channel for more upcoming presentations. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, Jason.